You know what happened to the Chinese when they were weak? It was really quite terrible. They refer to it as the century of national humiliation. They had the Japanese, the Europeans, and the Americans with their open door policy, exploiting them left and right, occupying them, killing large numbers of people. You go to Beijing, you ask any person this simple question. You have two choices. You can be 10 times more powerful than Japan, or Japan can be 10 times more powerful than you. Do you think it matters? What do you think the Chinese are going to say? The Chinese are going to tell you it is very important to be very powerful. We understand what happened in the past when we were weak. So they will go to great lengths to maximize their relative power. They will want to make sure that the power gap between them and Russia, them and Japan, them and India is as wide as possible. Just like we're very content with the fact that Canada and Mexico and Guatemala are small fish compared to us. It's not because we're evil, it's because it's the best way to survive in the international system. So number one, you can expect the Chinese to want to maximize their relative power, to grow and build a powerful military. Second, you don't think the Chinese are going to have a Monroe Doctrine? You think it's okay for us to be terribly upset when the Soviets send troops or missiles to Cuba, but they shouldn't get upset when we run aircraft carriers or aircraft up and down their coast because we're a benign hegemon or some nonsense like that. <laughs> My mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The same basic logic that applies to us should apply to them. Why shouldn't they want a Monroe Doctrine? If I were the National Security Advisor in Beijing and they asked me whether or not we should work hard to have our own Monroe Doctrine and push the Americans out beyond what they call the first island chain or beyond what they call the second island chain, I'd do everything I could to push the Americans out. I'd want to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. Is that because the Chinese are evil? Is it because they have a different culture than we do? Absolutely not. My argument here, as you've all surely figured out, is a structural argument. The structure of the international system leaves you little choice when you're powerful but to try and dominate your region of the world. So you read the newspapers over the next 20, 30 years, you'll see lots of evidence of the Chinese talking about dominating Asia, about pushing the Americans as far away as possible. Because they're not going to be happy about our aircraft carriers and our aircraft and our ground troops sitting on their doorstep for the same reason we're never happy when anybody does that to us. Now, what is the United States likely to do? How's the United States likely to respond? The record here is very clear. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. We're not going to allow China to dominate Asia. This is the basis of the pivot to Asia. And this is just the beginning. We're, we're not going to tolerate that. We do not tolerate pure competitors. It will go to enormous lengths to contain the Chinese. Chinese will go to enormous lengths to push us out, and we'll go to enormous lengths to contain them. Because again, you see our great fear is that if the Chinese dominate Asia, they'll be free to roam. You can already see the Chinese roaming in Asia. You can see them roaming in the Persian Gulf. And I'm not being critical of them for one second. I say this admiringly as a good realist. Right? <laughs> they roam but we do not want them roaming into our backyard. Great powers like the United States do not tolerate that. So we'll go to great lengths to contain them. Right? And then the question you have to ask yourself is, what will the neighbors do? Well, the neighbors will almost all balance with us. You can already see this beginning to happen. Just go home and Google Japan and India. Japan and India, despite the fact that they're separated by great distances and a lot of water, have basically jumped into bed together. And they're playing kissy face with each other. <laughs> and they're doing it mainly because of China. The United States and India, I often say to students, 
why are the United States and India such good friends today? And of course, the normal American answer is because they're both democracies. <laughs> to which I say, that can't be the answer because we were both democracies during the Cold War and we didn't get along with each other. <laughs> right? In fact, the Indians did not like us at all. Right? And we didn't really have much time for them during the Cold War. <laughs> something changed. And that something that changed is China. Right? The Indians are very nervous about China. And we are very nervous about China. So you can see the United States and the Indians moving closer together. The balancing coalition will look like this. It will include Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Australia, Indonesia, India, Russia, and the United States. Those will be the core players. Right? And the interesting question is what happens with countries like Pakistan, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. Right? Those are the four that are likely to be on the other side. But we will have all the powerful countries in Asia on our side. They'll be part of the balancing coalition. And the main reason is that those countries live next door to China, and China is much more of a threat to them than the United States is. Same reason everybody balanced against the Soviet Union and didn't balance against the United States. Because the Soviet Union, being a neighbor of the countries in Europe and in Northeast Asia, was a much greater threat than the United States was. So that'll be the balancing coalition.